I feel sad for people who are not accessing their own creativity and who, or who are ignoring it or who people, people who say, Oh, I can't draw. I think that's sad because anyone who has a hand and fingers and a pen or a pencil can draw. No one cannot draw. Anyone can draw. But if that attitude is, is so heartbreaking because I can't draw means you think you can't draw something that looks like what you think it's supposed to be. You know, people say, I can't draw me. They mean they can't make a dog look like a dog. But why does a dog have to look like a dog? And that attitude, the attitude like a dog does not have to look like a dog. That attitude is a really good attitude for life, I think. Like you can, you can draw a dog and it can be whatever it wants to be. It doesn't have to look like a dog. And that from, that's kind of my philosophy of life that, um, it, it that kind of indiv individuality is, is good. It's fine. You don't have to fit into a category. You don't have to fit into a group. You can be an outsider and that's okay because whatever is true is okay. <laughs> And welcome to episode 41 of Attention Engineer. I'm Laura and this is my podcast. Hi. Attention Engineer is a series where I seek to make the best use of my own valuable time and attention by having deep conversations with fellow artists about creativity, grit and determination. My aim is to consistently remind you and remind myself that creativity really is for everyone, because it really is. Let's kick that inner critic where it hurts and have a thought-provoking time in the process. You don't have to make something of your own after listening to this show. There's no homework. But please know that you can if you want to. Hello and welcome to Attention Engineer. How are you? I'm very well, thanks for asking. It's actually my first day back in the launch pad after an isolation holiday on a farm near Chepstow, just 30 minutes drive from my house in Bristol. The weather was gorgeous. We had blazing sun almost every day and we took very long walks in three different beautiful forests, plus managed to squeeze in a movie marathon of gritty 90s thrillers. Perfection. Tim and I really did need a break. I celebrated my 40th birthday last week with a number 24 spot in the official UK albums chart. So if you bought my new album, Exotic Monsters, a massive thanks to you for that wonderful present. It's been incredible reading messages from people telling me that my new songs are soundtracking their days. That is so cool to hear. This is my fifth big album release and even more than ever, I feel like I've handed the music over to you now. I took an intentional break from this podcast to concentrate on the album release and I am back now, but in the interest of continuing to pursue a life of mindful productivity and digital minimalism, I will be publishing episodes every fortnight from now on. I've been thinking a lot about capacity and bandwidth recently because burnout has been popping up regularly in my life for maybe the past year now. Plus, I was finding that doing an episode every week meant I couldn't make the most of the fantastic guests who have come on the show because it always felt like it was already time for the next episode. The aim of this podcast is to go deeper, not to speed through everything. So I'm looking forward to a slightly more relaxed pace. Today, I'm very keen to share a conversation with one of my all-time favourite songwriters, Juliana Hatfield. This chat really was a dream come true for me. Juliana Hatfield is a musician and songwriter who has been releasing excellent albums since 1987. First with the Blake Babies, then the Lemonheads, Solo and more. I first heard Juliana's work in the Juliana Hatfield 3, whose 1993 album Become What You Are spawned two hit singles, My Sister and Spin the Bottle, which was used in the film Reality Bites. Alongside her 17 original solo albums, Juliana's extensive back catalogue also includes work under the name Juliana's Pony, collaborations with Matthew Kors of Narda Surf under the name Minor Alps, and Paul Westerberg of The Replacements under the name The I Don't Cares. 
She's also worked with Amy Mann, Susanna Hoffs, Tanya Donnelly, Exine Savenka and John Doe. Plus, she even had a part in a Christmas episode of My So-Called Life. Juliana's work has been part of my record collection for as long as I can remember, always encouraging and inspiring me to share my innermost thoughts and record my own music. In 2018, I was beyond delighted to be invited to support the Juliana Hatfield 3 in London and Bristol, and it was a huge treat to get to speak to Juliana for this episode. Massive, massive thanks to Tanya Donnelly and Dean Fisher for helping to make this happen. You're the absolute best. In this conversation, we discuss writing about the truth, rejecting society's expectations and demonstrating alternative ways of living, finding creative freedom in limitations, sensitivity as a superpower, and home recording, Juliana's rocky transition from analogue to digital recording and how her new album Blood is her most misanthropic yet. Without further ado, here we go. This is a podcast about creativity and stuff, so um, we, can, we can really talk about anything. Um, and it's just such a delight to have you on it. I really appreciate you saying yes, because you're one of my favorites. So, Well, yeah, thank, thank you, you for asking me. Yeah, of course. Well, would you mind introducing yourself for the listeners, please? Uh, this is Juliana Hadfield uh, speaking from Cambridge, Massachusetts in the United States. Excellent. Um, how has life been going for you in the past year and a bit? It has been um, it has been interesting. Um, <laughs> I'll say more than that. Let's see what else can I say. I I feel like I'm I have dealt with the isolation maybe better than some other people because I I'm used to some isolation. I li- yeah. I've always I've always pretty much lived alone, and I because I prefer that, and I. Mm-hmm. I write alone and I, I record a lot alone. So I, I really do enjoy being alone and I actually thrive when I'm alone. So in that sense, I've been fine Mm -hmm. over the past year and a half. And I, fortunately, you know, I've been physically in good shape and I started running outdoors, which has been really great. I've, I've, that's a whole new, um, thing for me. And that, I mean, I used to do it when I was younger. I used to run a lot when I was in college and then I kind of stopped and now I'm doing it again. And I ran all winter through all the weather and, um, that's been good for me. Yeah. I, I took up running again, um, after, a, after a break, like beginning of last year. So January, mm-hmm. so I had all these ideas for like the new decade is going to be all of these new different things I'm going to do. <laughs> and I'd had an accident. I broke my foot a few years beforehand and I couldn't <gasps> run for ages. Yeah. It was horrible. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's been a massive, massive, like mental health saver for me. It's really good to hear you've gone into it as well. Yeah. And, it, and, and in the beginning, you know, when the, when the whole, all the locking down started, everything was so scary. You know, every time you, every time I coughed or every time, I had a sniffle. It was so scary. You know, we thought like, am I sick? And then when I started running and for a while, you know, it takes you a while to build up your endurance. And it took me some time to get into the rhythm of the breathing, the even breathing. And I would think like, oh, my lungs are messed up. What's wrong with me? But then once I find, I feel like I could feel my lungs getting stronger. And um, now I just get right into the rhythm of breathing right away. And it's Mm. just, it's just a very, I know that there's no, there's no promises or no reassurances really in terms of health. Anything could happen any day, but it makes me, it just somehow makes me feel good that I'm exercising, um, exercising my lungs and my heart. And it, it just makes me feel a little bit better. Yes. Mentally, mental health. Definitely. It's good for that. Yeah. For me as well, I think a lot of it's been about like, what things can I control? What's actually within my control and things like going for a run are within my control and things like writing a song are within my control to some extent and um, that kind of stuff. So yeah, I definitely hear that. Yeah, it's good. And it's part of the, it's soothing. I think things that are repetitive, repetitive um, actions, like running every couple of days, a certain path, and then um, just rituals, they're, they're soothing and they help give, they help give my life a kind of rhythm that, um, calms me down and mm. helps me, helps me to do everything else that I want to do. Like, a, you know, I'll run at a certain point and then I'll 
read at a certain point and then I'll write, I'll be working on writing at a certain point and having these structures to my days and nights really helps me to be able to just live more um, reasonably and productively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would imagine, I mean, to me, you seem like the most prolific artist ever because you're always putting out such, I'm going to gush a little bit, such brilliant albums, <laughs> right? And no. so regularly as well. Thanks. It's really impressive. Some Really someone I've looked up to for years. It's really interesting to hear you say that about um, routines and structures, because I think that stuff does really help with being. And when I say productive, I don't mean it in a kind of wringing every last bit of juice out of yourself, but like, spending your time in a focused way on the things that you need to and want to like writing music and stuff do you think that you get more done that you want to because of those structures and stuff well I I actually I always feel like I'm lazy and (laughs) I'm very self-critical and um I'm never contented really so I always feel because when I say I have these rhythms to my days that might mean I'll work on writing for an hour or even less and so in a day, you know, like when I was mm. making my new, new album and I started making it at home and some days I would work for an hour and then I would be burned out. It'd be a lot, a lot of that is because it's just like having to engineer myself that the and the technical stuff really just like depletes my energy and it makes my brain explode. So, mm. so anyway, I working on writing or recording for an hour in a day sometimes. And I feel like that is not a lot, but it's something. And it, at least I know that I've done something productive. And then there are other things that we, I do that contribute to my work. So, you know, there's reading and there's, there's thinking and there's absorbing or consuming other kinds of artwork and mm. um, information. So I think that if you're, if you're an artist, everything around you is contributing to your work, I think. Mm. Yeah. hundred percent. Corinne Tucker was talking to me on this podcast about how um, she thinks like writing for four hours a day is pretty decent. Oh, yeah. That is a lot. I think that's a lot. Yeah. Because it is a really, really cognitively demanding thing. And like you say, when when you're also doing the engineering, because which I also do for myself, it's a lot more different parts of your brain have to have yes. to work. It's really it is taxing. It is for me, especially as someone who I have this issue with um multitasking I'm terrible at multitasking and that includes my brain I can't Mm. my brain has to um focus on one thing at a time or I just like my head explodes so for example um when I'm listening to music or when I'm when I'm in the studio and listening back to my music I tend to instinctively cover my eyes with my hands Mm. because I seem to hear better when my eyes are closed and where I'm that's just this all sight is blocked out. Mm-hmm. So for me, it really helps to focus on one sense at a time if I can. Mm. And um, I don't know why I was even saying that. How does that relate to what you're saying about it? Relates to everything. I think I'm just nodding along when I'm quiet. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm agreeing. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I get easily overwhelmed by sense sensations by mm. things that are things in my environment that come in to my bubble if i'm if i'm concentrating on something and working um i'm so easily distracted by outside noises or noises in my building or by smells in my building like like lately mm. i've noticed that the person who lives below me has been cooking a lot of meat and i'm a, i've been, been a vegetarian for decades and i'm i'm like i'm pretty less i fair like i don't i'm not a i don't try to get other people to become vegetarian, but she's been cooking this really nasty smelling, I think it's might be lamb or something. It's just like Mm. a really gross smell for, for me. It makes me want to leave the building. So that, that, that's a distraction for me, Mm. um, smell. So, um, I don't know, make of that whatever (laughs) you want, but I'm, you know, yeah. I freak out, right? If there's too many noises going on at once, I can't handle it. And oh, it's like, yeah. I, get, I kind of get angry. And mm-hmm. so like, I've been in this house, which is a plenty spacious enough house. I feel very lucky and all that. Um, for the last past, hour, um, I was going to say hour and a half, past year and a half with my lovely husband, Tim, who you've met. Cause when I played mm-hmm. with you, he was there. Mm-hmm. Um, and he didn't used to work from home and it's been challenging, even though we have this wonderful relationship and he's learned about me that if there's music playing, 
and something else going on and then something else, I will just lose my fucking mind. Like I can't, I just can't cope anymore. So it's it's so, I mean, I'm sorry that that affects you too, but I'm so glad it's not just me because I felt like I was just unable to deal with life. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I really, I understand ex- mm. what you're saying and what you're feeling. I, I had the same experience. It just, it's just really, um, I have em- an emotional and physical reaction to that mm. kind of thing. Like, like too much, um, competing, um, information, you know, yeah. it's just like, it, it really depletes me and overwhelms me. And I don't know what, maybe that has something to do with our artistic brains or our musical brains or something. I don't know. We need to regiment everything, all the sounds or, 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 um, or we must be sensitive if we're artists. Mm. And I think that sensitivity is, um, pertains to all parts of life, really all yeah. the senses and all the feelings and thoughts and, and information. Yeah. And I grew up being told that being sensitive was not great. Like in, in all different ways I was told that. So not necessarily in words, but sometimes in words mm-hmm. and just people's actions. And I, so I, I grew up thinking there was something wrong with me because I was sensitive to things. But then I was listening mm-hmm. to Shirley Manson talking on a podcast the other day with Skin from Skunk and Nancy. Mm-hmm. And she was talking about how she thinks that being hypersensitive, as she called it, is actually a superpower. And that mm-hmm. made me feel so much better. It is. I mean, I, I do feel it's a superpower, uh, although it can be, um, it's a power, but it can diminish other um, abilities, I think. Mm. The superpower of extreme sensitivity can um, disable your social skills, I think. You know, like if there's too too much going on at a party, if it's too crowded or the music's too loud, I'll just, you know, I... I, I won't go. I will turn around and leave. Although I don't really go to parties anymore because I can't handle them. No. Um, I was going to say I wouldn't even be at that party. So good for you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't either. I mean, it's ridiculous to think that I would even ever go to a party. But <laughs> I feel like society, um, culture, Western culture, maybe all cultures, they seem to push everyone in a certain direction and they make you feel like there's something wrong with you if you're not on a track to, you know, always be partnering up with someone, having a, having a significant other. And Mm. if you're not sociable and if you're not like working toward buying a house and having children, and if you don't want to go to parties, you're made to feel there's something wrong with you. Mm. Maybe people are just afraid of the hypersensitive people because they know that the hypersensitive people are reading their minds. (laughs) Yes. We feel other people's pain and we know what people are feeling without being able to necessarily always articulate it or even understand it. But um, I think that that scares people, people who don't want to confront their feelings or they don't want to confront their dark sides. They're afraid of people like us who have hyper hypersensitive power, hypersensitivity powers. Yeah. Be afraid. Be yeah. Very afraid. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. I'm really excited about your new record as well. Um, I've been reading that you've you recorded that in your apartment or partly in your apartment. Is that right? Yes. I, that was another thing that I, um, I took on when, when lockdown started, I, I finally confronted garage band on my ah. laptop, something that I'd, I'd always wanted to figure out how to use, but never did just because I, I hate computers and I'm afraid of, the frustrations that come with technology mm-hmm. hitting the wall. So I, I did, I, I tackled that. And with the help of my friend, Jed Davis in Connecticut, um, I was able to figure out how to make GarageBand work for me. And Jed was really helped. He was like my um, troubleshooting partner or he, he helped me so much to, when I, when I encountered a problem, I would, run screaming to him and he would, he would talk me through, he was very calm and talked me through everything. So I, I did a lot of the album at home and then, and Jed took some things and worked, programmed some drums and added some things to some songs. And then when a big chunk of it was um, together, I, I brought it over to 
Q Division Studios brought it over, which, which it sounds like I put it in the truck in my car. <laughs> tapes. The t- I put the tapes in my car, but no, <laughs> I, the file. I sent the files over mm. to Q Division, and I, and then I added. I finished the stuff up at the real studio mm-hmm. and added some drum set, drum kit, and some different kinds of amp, amp loud amplifier, guitar sounds, and stuff like that. That's interesting because I remember when Peace and Love came out. Was it like around 2010? And I read that you'd recorded that at home. And yes. that really inspired me to start recording more at home. Were you recording at home with, with someone helping then for Peace and Love? No, I was. The difference then was that I was recording onto a freestanding eight track recorder, a, okay. an, eight tra- an eight track digital machine that had a, it had faders, you know, yeah, yeah. that I could work with my hands. And it had, um, built-in CD burner. And that was how I, I would mix these songs to a CD and it would, and then I would, you know, I could master from the CD. Oh, wow. So that, and then that was a great machine and I loved it so much. And I made a couple of whole albums on, I made the wild animals album also okay. on that, on that machine. And then the machine just died at some point. It just wouldn't work anymore. And then I, I, so for a while I was without anything um, to record any onto. And then um, I, I thought about going to find that exact mach- same machine on eBay and just replacing it. But then I didn't. And then I forced myself to just do garage band. Yeah. How, how do you find it now that you've, that now you've done a whole record on it? I hate it. <laughs> I hate it so much. No, I mean, it's fine. It's fine. It helped me. Mm. It, it's, it's helpful to be able to record um, this way, but I, it, I never can really get used to it. It's just like, I, I don't trust, I don't trust the machinery. I, just the fact that, you know, I, I can't, I can't put my hands on it. Mm. I can't, I can, you know, when I first, when I first opened GarageBand, I was like, already, I was gung ho. I was like, okay, let's do this. I got my microphone, cable, ready to plug in. And then I realized like, there's not, where do I plug in my microphone? There's no, there's no input. There's no hole big enough to stick it into. That's how, yeah. how ignorant I was. And then Jed, Jed told me I had to get an interface. Yes. So to, and I was like, oh my God, really? Like there's all this new stuff that I had to buy and I just... To, it might not sound like anything to anyone else, but to me, it was like climbing mountains to even understand what an interface was and then to have to, sh- you know, shop for one. Mm-hmm. Before that, I would just plug the microphone into the machine. Yeah. And then the each input was had its own fader, which I could see and move with my fingers. But now I'm using, I have to use a cursor to make any movement. And it's just like, you have to learn that whole other um that whole world of touch and everything. Yeah. Well, no, I, I totally understand. And I don't think it's it's at all weird that you you had that experience. And uh, hopefully pe- some people listening will just feel better that they don't automatically know how to do complicated things. Yeah. Because you only know when you know, like it's only obvious right. when it's, when you've learned it. And I live with a man who's learning at the moment how to record his own music. And he is going through a lot of emotional mountains. Oh yeah. Really hard. So, and, and I've been through it myself. I had a, I had a Jed when I first started recording myself, my friend, Mike was the person on the end of the line <laughs> and I'd call him and go, why isn't this working? When I was trying to use Cubase in like 2000 and pff, well, when some year, I don't know, 2006 or something. Uh-huh. So now like I'm, I'm fairly okay with it all, but I still, I still remember that it's terrifying and there's always something new to learn anyway. Oh, it's like, that's what I was telling Jed. It, it's like, I would encounter some new problem and it's like a labyrinth really. I mean, the internet in general, but even garage band, there's just like intimate, um, infinite tracks. There's it's infinity and it's terrifying and Mm -hmm. overwhelming so much because of that. It's a Mm -hmm. labyrinth that you never, you never will be able to make your way through the labyrinth because it's never ending. It's just, and that for me, that's um an that's awful that's an awful thing mm-hmm. and some people find that exciting and freeing but i like to have 
boundaries in mm-hmm. every way and in every area of my life. And there, with this, with, with this stuff, there are no boundaries, and I, I don't like that. Mm. And and I'm all, and I'm I'm surprised at how many people take to this stuff so quickly and easily, or seem to. I think they just seem to, honestly. And everyone's like, "Oh yeah, the latest thing I got that done." And for me, it's like every time the world or the culture or the um, capitalism tells me that I have to upgrade my technology. I just, I, I resist and I push against it and I push and push. And I'm like, I, and everyone else seems to be like floating along. Sure. No problem. I'll, I'll learn this next version of this newest latest technology and then I'll get the next thing. No problem. And why is there not more resistance? And also why is everyone able to figure everything out? And I'm not. I really don't think that's true, though. I know. I know. <laughs> but yes, but no, I what, it, well, so then why aren't more people talking about it? How about these issues? Maybe it's because they can't turn their computer on to have a chat about it. Maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe. They're all on like CB radios having a complaint about about GarageBand, I think. Yeah. No, I I think I think um, there are probably a lot of people who because you could do anything now. And let's yeah, even just talking about GarageBand and Logic and all those things, you can have infinite tracks, infinite instruments, infinite ideas. Your songs can be as long as you want. But I think that will paralyze a lot of people into not doing anything. And that is that is bad. Yeah. Those constraints really, well, the constraints of a pop song, the constraints of any kind of, not commercial, but any kind of song mean that you can only do so many things which means that you can have this like infinite creativity within three and a half minutes, four minutes. But if, if someone could do anything, then it's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've always thought that um, the more choices I have, the more problems I have, you know, like the more decisions, that's just more decisions to be made, which is just complicating my life. And mm-hmm. I've, I've always worked really well within tight, uh, with with tight limitations, I, f- I find freedom in, um, limitation. Like if mm. like budget, maybe it's budgetary limitation or it's number of tracks limitation. Um, I, f- I, f- I do really well with, um, without having a lot of choices. And yeah. I know when I used to have to, I would have a certain amount of days in which I had to record an album or, I had a certain number of tracks and you learn to be, you're forced to be really creative and in those situations. And also you're forced to accept certain performances, certain flawed performances. You have to accept their imperfections and those imperfections can actually become beautiful to you or maybe they're beautiful immediately. But, you know, if you're, if you have just infinite, possibilities to tweak and polish something it'll just polish it into into blandness you can you can the danger is you're gonna do so many takes that you lose the initial spark or you over polish something to the point of dullness yeah I totally agree with that um did you find that do you find, let me, I wanted to ask you about how you have put music out under lots of different names. So would you say that those are kind of limitations that you set on yourself or, or, um, were they ways of thinking about a particular collection of songs to come out in a certain way? I think it's way, way, maybe ways of thinking Hmm. about, or, or I'm just trying to, um, yeah, give, give a certain project, a certain feeling maybe, like mm. Juliana's pony was like a very much like an indulgence, I think. Um, That's one of my f- absolute favorites. Oh, it, thank you. Yeah, really. And is. that and it had I gave it a name because it was a unique lineup. It was mm. me, Mikey Welsh, and Zeph and Courtney, who were never we were never together on any other recordings, and it just seemed to call for um, a certain se- separation from my other things. Mm. And then, then there's the fact that I just have so many songs and they need places to go. They need slots to go into. Or otherwise it's just like a million Juliana Hatfield songs. And who's yeah. really going to pay attention to that? <laughs> I think a lot of people would, but it's, <laughs> I think it's better that you're someone who doesn't assume they would because your music's probably better. If you know like what it, I mean. Right. Well, <laughs> you, one worries about oversaturation, but then... 
then I have to realize like I'm such a small fish in the pond of popular music that I'll ne- there's no possibility of my oversaturating anything ever. Yeah. Oversaturating any area because the area that I'm in is small enough that actually, yeah, it's small enough that I can oversaturate it easily. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I'll never oversaturate the large market. Yes, I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, so talking about millions of songs, because I do think you've already released millions of songs. Do you have loads that sit around that you then have to find the slot for? No, no, not really. I I I usually when I'm making an album, I usually have just enough songs to fill an album or maybe one or two extras. So when I'm writing, I'm usually working toward an album's worth of songs. Mm. But what I what I do have billions of are little um snippets of sound, little tons and tons of tapes and videos and recordings of pieces of music or pieces of pieces of melody or chord progressions or riffs, tons of that stuff that I can go back and listen to and try to patch together later. Do you find yourself going back to that very often? I I do. Every every time I start writing after a period of not writing, I'll go, I'll first go and start to look at little snippets of music and see, seeing if there's anything that I can um, work with. Mm. And, I, and some of that stuff will get me, it'll just get me like um, started on um, writing again. Yeah. Cause I, I, I ask everyone this when they mention their ideas library, cause I have one that every now and again, I just think I should delete it. And then I think, even its existence means I'm never having to start from the blank page. So I never have to be frightened. There's always something. Oh yeah. And you don't know if there's, um, if you could find gold in there later, you know, like, cause I know for, for me, I don't always appreciate my ideas in the moment and I'll think I'll toss things and think this is crappy. But then I'll, if I go back and listen years later um, I'll think it's brilliant. And that actually happened a few, I, when I was doing these um, fan funded albums on mm. pledge music, mm-hmm. one of the, one of the things I offered for sale was um, I, I sold some of my old cassettes full of, what did you call them? You had a really nice name for them. Ideas libraries. Yeah, Ideas. I did. That's like a nice that. name. So <laughs> I, I sold a few of my idea library cassettes, cassettes mm. full of, full of musical ideas, full, like 45 or 90 minutes full. Oh, wow. And I sold one to a guy that I know in, he's in um, Cornwall actually. Mm. And I, I took a listen to it. You know, I, I, I listened fairly carefully to these before I sold them. And I thought like, yeah, I can, this stuff's not so great. I can, I'll, I'll get rid of these and it I'll, won't worry about it. And then my friend in Cornwall, after it, a little while he sent the cassette back to me. He, he just thought that I might, I don't know why exactly. I think he thought I might want it back Mm. and I listened to it again. And I, and I heard this keyboard chord progression that I don't, I didn't remember ever having created or recorded, but, um, and suddenly it's, it jumped out and I thought it was great. And that that became a song called um, what's it called? It's from the weird my al- my weird album. It became mm. the basis of the song. It's so weird. Mm-hmm. Oh wow! And if he hadn't sent it back to me, I probably never would have written that song. Yeah, I love that. That's yeah. great. So like previous Juliana had an idea that modern day Juliana could use. That's cool. Yeah, it's like a message from the past. Yeah. (laughs) That's nice. In the future. Yeah. Do you find that you are someone who crafts songs? Um, Because I talk to a lot of songwriters, of course, for this, and I think about it a lot myself. And there seems to be two different things people talk about. They talk about crafting a song and then they talk about kind of um, channeling a song that comes in more of a fully formed way so that the person doesn't think that they wrote it themselves. It's kind of coming from energy or mystical places Mm -hmm. um but you but you sound like someone who writes with quite a lot of intention so I was just wondering how that works for you well I 
It feels like a combination of both things to me. Mm-hmm. Writing a song is like a collaboration between me and the muses or me and the universe or the gods mm-hmm. or whatever, however you want to characterize um, whatever it is that brings the music to me. Because it does feel, it does feel like I'm being given this music mm. um but it's not it's not enough for me just to sit there eating bonbons and accepting it i have to do like i said it's a collaboration so i have to get in the dirt i'm using a lot of like metaphors here yeah, that's good like, and i have to start really like hauling i start digging digging in the dirt craft the crafting part is a big part of it and you have to put in the work it's like mining really it is Mm -hmm. it's like once I've put in a lot of work on a song and and it can be sometimes a song will be written in a few days sometimes it takes months and months of me just chipping away at it Mm -hmm. and and some of them don't even make it some of them after months of work I have to say like this is not this is not working this is not going to work Mm. and I'll throw it away but some are easier than others some are like very difficult labors another metaphor very very long difficult labors Mm. some end in death but you know and the songs don't ever come to completion but some of them are like like my birth my actual birth this is not a metaphor I was a I was a precipitous birth which meant that um, I was early and fast. Like what one one night my mother felt like, oh wow, something's happening. And she called to my father. And before my father got upstairs, I was already all, all, all coming out. Wow. And so I basically and and this is like I'm gonna just put in another bit of information about that. Evan, my friend Evan Dando mm. wrote a song called It's About Time. And which had to do, he was trying to write from my perspective and he wrote some, it's the line is fell out on the street. And that was a reference to my birth, Mm. my precipitous birth came coming out of my mother quickly and and easily. So um, some songs are like that. They, they feel like they wanted to be born and they just can't, they come out quickly. And the song It's So Weird was like that. The song I was just talking about, um, that that happened really quickly and it felt kind of like an, a dream. And it was a song that was not written before I went to the studio. And and I had recorded, I'd recorded most of the album already, the album Weird. And, and then this song, um, was tagged on at the end. It just want, it wanted to be written. So it happened really quickly. And that one was, that was one that really felt like it was um, just kind of given to me and it want, it would, it like already felt kind of like it already existed. So that was a really long answer. That's good. That was a really interesting <laughs> answer. Yeah. Well, thanks. For, thanks for telling me that. I, I find mm-hmm. that so interesting. I, I've got a song called Cancel Your Hopes, which is a, obviously a very cheerful song, which <laughs> um, I was, um, I basically wrote it in 2005 and recorded it on a mini disc and then lost all my mini discs and then found them mm. all again and then finished it off like really fast. So it felt like, yeah, like past Laura was going, here, have this gift. Yeah. And I went, thanks. <laughs> and I made it into this song. It was going to be the first single off from the new project, but it seemed like it was far too depressing during a pandemic to say, cancel your hopes to people as the first thing. Um, <laughs> so I, <yeah>. I waited. <laughs> but mm-hmm. it's um, it's fine now. It's fine to be weird again now, surely by now. I hope, I hope so. Yeah, because your record surely isn't all like um, happy, clappy, everything's going to be okay, is it? What's the general theme? I think it might be my most misanthropic album ever. Awesome. I'm excited then. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's fun. It's fun, but it's not up with people. It's kind of down with people. Mm. Do you know, do you know what up with people is? Have you heard of that? No, I haven't. Oh, I don't, I can't, wow, I can't even explain it. It's a, it's a, I'm going to have to even, I'm going to have to Google it because I can't remember. It's something from my childhood. It was like some campaign 
that went on the road to try to hmm. celebrate something. I don't know. It might've been like a, I, but when I say up with people, it's like, it means, you know, very um, positive confidence rock. Yes. Which this is not, it's the opposite of that. My new yeah. album. Okay. But it's a, it's just a reflection of um, the past four years in, in general and the past year in particular, how mm -hmm. it's, it has been kind of um, a challenge for people. Um, in my country, I was thinking of the past four years, you know, but yeah. it's been a, cha a challenge all over, the, all over the place. And that is really reflected in the songs. Yeah. I love that you do that. So Pussycat was one of my, another one of my favorite albums of yours. And the fact that you're so unafraid to just say exactly what you think about very specific people and things that are going on, it makes sense that of course the, you know, the, the albums afterwards would then like catch us up to where we are currently. Well, I, I, I tried not to be too specific um, with this stuff just because there's a danger when you name names that it's going to be jarring years later to hear those names when they're not in the in the news anymore so yeah yeah I try I I think the new stuff is is not as specific and it's more um generally just angry and um out for blood really out for vengeance vengeance and sick and tired of it all but yeah. also but in a not in a um it's it's not a hopeless album it's it's more just really driven driven to justice i think mm. and it's it's trying to use wanting to use um i don't know it's it's actually it's actually not it's not hopeful that's for sure it's not a hopeful mm. album it's it's resigned it's resigned yeah i think that the idea of wanting the bad guys to be punished is, I guess in a way you could say that's hopeful because it's not accepting, it's not accepting that the bad guys will win. It, it yeah. won't, it's, it won't accept that the bad guys are winning. Yeah. I think that it's hard to be hopeful all the time anyway at the moment. And I think it would be very jarring to just make albums full of really happy music. Although I understand escapism is important and I'm not d slamming anyone who makes happy music at all. Mm -hmm. It's just personally... I'm more about mirroring what's going on and then sort of trying to imagine different realities, I suppose. I suppose I just want to keep reminding people that they have personal power and they don't have to just let this stuff happen to them as well. Yeah, and I, I think music itself is an escape. Whatever, whatever the content is, whatever the music is saying, I think it, it does, it's still an escape, whatever, mm. no matter what is being said. For me anyway, the act of, playing music is an escape for me. Even if I'm singing my songs about wanting to punish someone, it's, <laughs> it's like, um, I, I go into this other space in my brain and my, my emotion where I'm ecstatic in a way because it takes me out of my, um, physical reality. And I, I feel like I'm in an, another better place where I'm above, above it all. Yeah. Not not in a um, prideful way. I just mean above it, like I'm floating above it. Mm. Yeah. I was thinking of, of it of kind of also about, it's kind of stretching time because we, we stretch experiences out into songs. So like a thing that took a second or a feeling that lasted for a few minutes can, can you know, fill a whole song, a whole album, whatever. Yeah. So it's that floating above things really interesting too. I like that. Yeah. Um, I like to write about the truth. For me, the truth is um it's ne it's never really about smiling all the time. <laughs> Some people think that it's it's good to try to smile all the time, but i'm I would rather not smile when I don't feel good. Um, I'd rather just be honest about it. Um for me, that just makes more sense for me. Mm -hmm. Well, it's more realistic, isn't it? I think it's especially with um, things as they are online. It can just be like this barrage of shiny, shiny stuff and everyone having a great time and everyone knowing how to use all the computer software, you know. Yeah. And feeling like we're the ones who have a problem. 
but everyone's going through everything. Yeah. And I think, I guess I'm just trying to be a voice for some other kind of truth or some, uh, some other kind of reality. I, or I'm not trying to do anything. I'm really just, I'm just, I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to put any message out there. I'm just trying to um, express myself. That's mm-hmm. all. I think, I think for me, that's just what I do. I'm trying to express the, the truth of my own existence. Yeah. And, and I, maybe it's because there are all these messages coming at us that are telling us to be a certain way or, you know, telling us that we, are supposed to understand all the technology and we're supposed to like it and we are supposed to buy it every few years. And, you know, I don't believe that's true. So I talk about that kind of stuff. Like, I don't like yeah. that. I don't like this. I don't like that. Um, I don't accept it. I talk about that stuff and all the, all the other things that the culture um, tells you and, the, the culture and media, they tell you that you're supposed to be, mm. you know, you're supposed to be able to do everything well. You're supposed to be happy. You're supposed to be married you're, or partnered. You're supposed to have kids, you're supposed to own a home. You're supposed to buy this stuff, all that stuff. I reject all that stuff. Mm. And I talk about it. Yeah. And the thing is, if we're humans. So if we have an emotion, we feel something about something. We're not the only person who's ever felt that way because we're not robots or we're not an alien so every we're not as alone as we feel yeah there's this thing I was I was learning about the other day I wish I could quote it I'm terrible at that stuff but someone was talking about a study where (laughs) people um people were told a story about someone who was like an outsider and then someone who wasn't an outsider and every single like almost every single person identified with the person who was an outsider Hmm. because everyone feels this way they might not seem like they do and maybe not everyone but, but many more people than we might think feel like they're the outside person. And so if you're making outsider art mm-hmm. or making art that is from the place of feeling that way, then I think people will respond to that because they feel that way too, you know? Yeah. And I, I think that's what I'm, I'm, I mean, totally invested in that, or I rely on that ho- hoping or knowing and understanding that other people feel like I do and that, mm. And that people are, people are not just types. They're not, you know, you can't just put everyone into a category, which is what the media tries to do. And even what people try to do. I think that people are so brainwashed right now by all the media and um, that, that, that they, they really think of people as representations of types Mm -hmm. and that if you, go out if you say anything outside the boundaries of what your type is supposed to say and think and feel then people are like that's not normal um or that's different which was which like that's such a strange modern um way way of looking at things you'll hear some if you have a point of view that doesn't fit into one of the um representational categories someone might react and say, that's, oh, that's different. Like your take on something is different, which is like, you can't even, different is not a descriptor. It has to be different to something else. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. Very good point. Yeah. Do you find the internet to be a generally good thing in your life? Oh, I have such mixed emotions about this. Cause I, um, it, on any given day, there will be a moment in the day where I'm saying, I hate the internet. The internet's bad. The internet's so bad. But then I'll find myself using the internet to um, keep, you know, I use it to keep my career afloat, basically. Yeah. Without it, without it, I'm kind of screwed at this point because um, it, we're, like these days I can, I've been doing a live stream once a month and I can just like broadcast um, a show to people all over the world and then they can donate money if they feel like it. And I just can, it comes, it's like this direct um, me to them, them to me. Mm. And that's a wonderful, beautiful thing that I can do. And I can um, tell, you know, there's all sorts of wonderful things that I can do with, with the internet. Yeah. I also hate it. Yeah. 
I feel the same. <laughs> it's yeah. so great because really it's not a thing that's separate from humanity at this point. It's just, it's, it is the world as well as the world is the world. It's all part of it. But it's, I mean, my, my whole new record's about my struggle with it. It's just like, it's, it's awful, <laughs> but then it's amazing because, you know, people will hear it via the internet. <laughs> right. So, like, well, and they, screwed, yeah. they won't, they won't know about it otherwise. And yeah. I just, I feel so, I don't know how old you are and I'm not going to ask, but <laughs> I, I am so, I feel so fortunate to have grown up before the internet. Yeah. You know, I grew up um, in the 1970s. There was no internet. Well, at least it was probably being developed, but it, no one knew what it was. It what it didn't exist. There was no, there were no cell phones. Mm. It was just landlines and cable TV was just like coming into homes in, in my neighborhood in the, like the eighties. So, and when I was a kid, there was not even, there were just a few television channels, um, no internet. And I, I feel so blessed to have had a life to have known a life before the internet because it's now it's like now. And then it's such a completely different world now. Yeah. And, um, you know, I can't imagine what it, I can't imagine growing up in this world today. Oh, it's terrifying. I grew up in the nineties. Yeah. So uh -huh. I also remember a time before mm -hmm. phones, internet, all that. And uh, someone was asking me, oh, who was it? Maybe it's just Tim and I, I don't, I don't talk to anyone else. <laughs> so it must've uh -huh. been him or maybe it's my sister just talking about what did we used to do beforehand. We did a lot of crafting. Uh -huh. I did very complicated cable knitting as a child and I did cross stitch and I read loads of books and I wrote in my diary and I wrote letters to my friends. Um, actual letters that I posted in the post on paper and it was brilliant when I got home from school the bullies could not have a go at me via several right. different social media channels right I had a break from them oh yeah and if you needed information you had to go find the information I like yeah if you wanted to know um the temperature outside and in, in my town we'd call a number it was like six and seven blah, 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 one two three four <laughs> And um, it would say the time and the temperature. You could get that on the phone. Yeah. Or you, and you know, you had to look things up in the encyclopedia, or you had to go to the library yeah. if you needed information. If you if you had to do research, you'd go to the library and you'd like find the books that you needed, and or you'd or you'd look at the old um, you get on the um. Oh, what you call that machine? That Do you mean like the microfiche thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. microfilm. Yes. You, you fight <laughs> microfilm. You sit in front of a microfilm machine. And you'd scroll yeah. like old newspapers. Yes, I remember looking at those in my yeah. for our history class. We had to go into this dusty old place and look at those things. It was really good. I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm not saying that was better. I'm just saying. Bring back microfilm, says Julia. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying it was different, and yeah. that I, you had to. You had to like put. You had to do more work to get information and, yeah. and you I think that maybe you felt more secure that the information was true because um these days you, there's a payoff if you're putting out alternative information or fake news there's a there's yeah. maybe a payoff for you but back then there was no payoff yeah news was just news and um now it's in, now it's entertainment and it's Oh my gosh. I sound like, now I sound like an old, an old, like crotchety. <laughs> no, no more than I do. And the thing right. is though, like, I, I think there's so many wonderful things about it and there's so many horrible things about it. And it is interesting yeah, to go, well, exactly. it, it used to be easier to focus on something. I do think that's true. Yes. And I, I think that some people now look at, some people probably perceive intense focus as a, um, like focus as something bad or because if you're focused on anything for too long then you're missing out on all the other things oh right, yeah. yeah but you're talking about multitasking earlier and I honestly think I used to I used to pride myself on being able to multitask for some for some reason I thought that well not for some reason because the culture told me that was a that's a good thing to be able to do I was all over that like you know 15 different tabs open do working on loads of different things at once and and honestly I don't know if it's just from getting older or from thinking about this stuff more but I just find it impossible and I've been reading a lot of stuff about how it takes like 15 minutes to get your um, cognitive strength back once you've been interrupted in a task. Like it, it's it's like oh, that. Wow. So if you check an email, yeah. then you're screwed for the next 20 minutes. You can't work at capacity in your brain. 
after that? I believe that. And that's the way, you know, everything is set up to work these days. It's set up to um, rewire our brains like that. And that's, that's a scary thought. Yeah. And even I, I was just telling you that some days I would, I work on recording or writing for only an hour or something. And mm. I, I remember when I was younger in my twenties, I would have these um, marathon songwriting sessions where I'd be up all night working on a song. And it was like, so it was so thrilling in a way to just get, to get so lost in the process and in the, in the song I was working on, I could just go for like 10 hours and I'd go all night. Mm. And, and now it's, that doesn't really happen anymore. And I don't know if it's because my brain has changed because of what's going on, the way that our brains are all being rewired by, by modernity, or if it's just cause like, it's an age thing. My brain is just like, doesn't have the power anymore to focus, but it's definitely kind of sad and scary that I don't have, I don't seem to have the capacity for the intense hours of focus that I used to, or there are, it's, it makes me sad to think about it. Mm. I've recently been experimenting a bit more though with like coming back to things um, continually because I heard Amy Mann talking about songwriting and on a podcast once and she was talking about how it's a good idea to keep the song present in your life if it isn't finished yet. So rather than start it one week and then leave it for a month, like mm. you know, just come back to it every few days or something. Yeah. Play through it and keep plugging away. And I, I was very guilty of like coming up with an idea, feeling quite satisfied with that idea, leaving it for ages and then booking a studio and taking it in to finish it then and there, which was risky, I think, because the lyrics could maybe have been even better if I'd spent a bit more time beforehand. So I like now just like going back to things and and doing like you were saying, chipping away. I use that phrase a lot, just like doing a little yeah. bit more, a little bit more. And maybe it's to do with repetition because you've done uh-huh. about a thousand albums. So yeah. it's not like the first album you've ever done. So I'm going to stay up all night because it's like exciting and thrilling and not that it's not exciting and thrilling, but it's just something else. Maybe. Yeah. I, I like to think maybe it's just because I have more um, of a grasp on how to do it now. Like I, yeah. I uh, or those, those, that machinery inside of me that writes songs is more supple now or something like it's I can get in the groove easier now maybe I don't know I don't know it's a kind of a mystery yeah maybe it just doesn't take you as long to write the yeah that's what I mean maybe (laughs) maybe um maybe yeah I've just gotten a handle on it I don't know it's got really good at it I don't know (laughs) I would never say that (laughs) I know I I I got the impression you wouldn't so I thought I'd say it for you okay (laughs) Um, I know you've got lots of chats to do today, so I'm going to wind up because I, I'd love to talk to you forever, but you have, you know, other things, other people to talk to. So just towards the end, I'd love to ask you what the word creativity means to you and how intentional you are about that. Creativity is a way of living. It's it's crucial. It's what keeps me connected to life, really. Mm. I um, it's, it's really the only thing I can depend on. It's, it sustains me. It's a life force. And I feel it's why I am here. Mm. And it's a lot of things that no one sees or hears that I'm working on. It's not just music. I'm, I do other things. And um, for, for myself. Yeah. It's, I think it's a, it's sanity. I feel sad for people who are not accessing their own creativity and who, or who are ignoring it or who people, people who say, Oh, I can't draw. Mm. I think that's sad because anyone who has a hand and fingers and a pen or a pencil can draw. Yeah. No one cannot draw. Anyone can draw. But if that attitude is, is so heartbreaking because I can't draw means you think you can't draw something that looks like what you think it's supposed to be. You know, people yes. say I can't draw me. They mean they can't make a dog look like a dog. But why does a dog have to look like a dog? And that attitude, the attitude like, 
a dog does not have to look like a dog. That attitude is a really good attitude for life, I think. Yeah. Like you can you can draw a dog and it can be whatever it wants to be. It doesn't have to look like a dog. And that from that's kind of my philosophy of life. That um it, it that kind of indiv- individuality is is good. It's fine. You don't have to fit into a category. You don't have to fit into a group. You can be an outsider and that's okay because whatever is true is okay. I'm just grinning because that's such a beautiful way of putting it. If someone came to you and said, Juliana Hatfield, I want to be creative in my life. What should I do? What would you tell them to do? I would say take a piece of paper a blank piece of paper and a pen or whatever you like to, whatever feels pleasing to your hand, you know, pen, pencil, magic marker, crayon, whatever. Take a piece of paper and this, that writing utensil, and then look at something in the room, whatever it is in front of you, a flower, a book, a dog, a table, whatever. Um, And then without looking at the paper, only looking at the object, draw it without looking at the paper. Mm. And then when you're done, then you can look at the paper. And th- this is a, you know, this is an exercise that, that I did not invent that ev- anyone who's been to art school will probably have been told to try this yeah. um, technique, but it's great to draw without looking at what you're drawing and it will maybe open your heart and mind to creativity and the things that show up on the page are, can be so genius and so surprising and so funny and so beautiful and artistic. And it's just like a really, I try to do it a lot, mm. draw, drawing without looking. And it always um, helps me feel better about everything. I was trying to do a lot of drawing because I'm someone who was like, I can't draw. And then I realized that was dumb and I started trying to just do it. And I did some online classes and stuff. And this blind, I think it's called blind contour drawing, isn't it? If you want to put a put a, a name to it. And I remember I was doing a bunch of bunch of sketches. And then when I look back at the sketchbook, those ones were the ones I liked way more than the ones I was trying to make look like a cup uh-huh. or whatever. They just had something more to it. Yeah, and they definitely they will they will show you a part of you that you never know knew you had inside of you, or it'll show you something outside of yourself that you were able to access. It can be really eye-opening and it kind of um, shows you how much that you don't know in a, in a great way, how much you can access and um, without having had any idea that you had access to this kind of thing. And I, I have, I've tried to get other people to do this with me and some, some people are so resist, resistant to it and they're, mm. it's like, they're really freaked out by it and by not being able to look at the paper. They're just like totally freaked out by the loss of control, but letting go of that control is, is such a good exercise. And it, it leaves me more open to um, everything. It, it, It helps me to be less controlling in my thought. Um, and it's just like a, a really good exercise to, to do. Yeah. And it's interesting. It seems to link back to what you were saying earlier about, um, that piece, that piece of music that you had on the tape that you didn't think was any good or you've, you, you'd given away and then it came back and you forgot you'd written it and then it became a yeah. song. So it's because I yeah. think it's really easy to like write a song or not easy to write a song, but it's easy to finish something or, or, or start something even and then look at it and immediately discard it because it's not good enough or it's not what you thought it was going to be or something. Whereas if you have that distance, so like I'm looking at these blind contour drawings going, oh, wow, that's, that's really cool from two summers ago or something but probably I would have looked at it that day and gone that's not a photorealistic representation of a cup I suck at art I'm never going to draw again right you know and it's um like letting go of that expectation that everything has to be how you thought it was going to be yeah because that was just a thought it wasn't anything yet right just let go let go of the expectations or the um it's good when perception changes when you can see things from different um points of view I think yeah and maybe sometimes that takes a few years to be able to for you to be able to see something in a different way yeah yeah so don't delete your ideas library then is what you're saying to me unless you're (laughs) unless you're being um 
buried, literally buried by it and you can't breathe yeah. and you have to dig your way out, then you can maybe like think about getting rid of the stuff that does not spark joy. Yes. I'll just Marie Kondo <laughs> the shit out of my computer. That is yeah. sort of one of my plans actually. <laughs> one day. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it's been such a wonderful thing to talk to you today. I really appreciate you coming in and doing this. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. I think you know what to do. If you haven't got your copy of Blood yet, please visit julianahatfield.com for all the information you need to change that fact. The deluxe show notes page for this episode is at penfriend.rocks forward slash Juliana. There's a really excellent short film about Juliana on that page, as well as links to her back catalogue. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a music-loving friend. And you're both very welcome to grab two free songs and receive thoughtful letters on music and art via my website. If this was your first episode of Attention Engineer and you'd like to continue this journey, I think you might enjoy episode one starring Tanya Donnelly and episode 22 starring Bernard Butler. Make sure you subscribe to the series too. My new album Exotic Monsters is out now and I'm running seriously low on limited edition coloured vinyl, CDs and other fun bits of merch. So check out all things Penfriend at penfriend.rocks. This podcast is powered by my Correspondence Club. Huge thanks to you all. And if you feel inspired to sponsor a future episode and get a shout out, please head to penfriend.rocks forward slash sponsorship. As I said earlier, this show is now a fortnightly one. So I'll catch you in a couple of weeks to share my conversation with Shingy Shoniwa. Till then, take care. <laughs>